Fair warning, if you haven't already checked out our short film, The Necklace, definitely do that before you watch this video. Spoilers ahead. So we made another short horror movie, and this time Victoria doesn't die. Well, not in the traditional sense. We wanted to try something different, something more stylistic and hypnotizing without relying on any jump scares. Okay, maybe we had a couple jump scares with the flashes of the devil, but overall it's a much slower, and I think creepier movie, than our others. Our hope was to get under your skin and stay there for the rest of the day, instead of just making you jump out of your seat. We were hugely inspired by some horror classics like The Exorcist and The Shining. We even alluded to The Exorcist a couple times, like The Flashes of the Devil and The Grandfather Clock coming to a complete stop. I think if there's one thing I've learned from making this film, it's that we don't always need to rely on jump scares or loud startling music to creep you out. Sometimes it even detracts from the story. Don't get me wrong, I'll continue to use jump scares because, well, they work really well. See? But I think a combination of atmospheric tension and the occasional jump scare makes for a pretty awesome horror movie experience. All of our other shorts took place inside, so we wanted to try something different and shoot somewhere else for a change. We always thought the woods behind our house was super creepy, and we'd been trying to come up with an idea of something we could shoot there for quite a while. I wasn't looking forward to dragging all of our film equipment into the woods, but I haven't been to the gym in a while and I could use a workout, so yeah. We had to come up with a reason for why Victoria was just walking alone in the woods, so we decided to finally feature our dog Tink, since he's usually on set anyway, acting like a diva. Aaron said it perfectly. This story was an adventure into testing out a different kind of scare, and I've made it my personal mission to scare the pants off you all. I've already written the next short film script. You've been warned. The script definitely evolved during this production. After our first draft, Aaron even said, looks like this one's going to be pretty easy to shoot. Yeah, it wasn't. In fact, aside from the ice cream man, this was one of our most challenging productions. As the script evolved, we added moments like me watching the little girl on her bike, which was a last minute addition, because it felt like it helped convey the necklace's intentions more clearly. And then when Aaron put together the rough cut, I suggested that we add the shot in the bathroom with the blood written on the mirror to help convey that the necklace was a pawn in the creature's ultimate possession of my character. After discussing the concept, Victoria wrote the first draft, and from there we fine-tuned it together. Originally, we had this idea where Victoria would be walking in the woods, and all of a sudden she would see some rubble rolling down the hillside which catches her attention and reveals the necklace but we quickly realized that creating a mini avalanche of rocks and debris seemed a bit too complicated for our non-existent budget, and so we decided to just change it to a monster roar. I think that ended up being even scarier anyway, and it was way easier to do. We shot the entire film over four days, only shooting for a few hours at a time. We woke up at 6 a.m. on day one, just so that we could get all the shots in the woods with that thick morning fog in the background. The fog only lasts for a couple hours in the early morning, so we were rushing as fast as we could to get all the coverage we needed. The opening shot of the spider web wasn't even planned. We were walking to the location and stumbled across the most perfect spider web I've ever seen. It was backlit by the sun and drenched in morning dew, so the nerdy filmmaker in me was like, how could I not film this? I think the most difficult shot of the entire short was this one, where Victoria enters the house, drops the necklace on the counter, takes the leash off her dog as we slowly push in, then we pull back as she picks up the necklace off the floor. It looks simple when you watch it, but we did somewhere around 30 takes. First of all, there were three focus marks we had to hit. First when she puts the necklace on the counter, second when she walks to the door and takes off the leash and third when she walks back to the kitchen and picks up the necklace off the floor. I was pushing the dolly and pulling focus at the same time, which is never easy. I had to set up the dolly in such a way where you could see all the action that was taking place. I don't have a fluid head attached to the dolly, and even if I did, I can't push the dolly, focus, and tilt at the same time, so it was important that Victoria hit all the right marks. I had her bend down as low as she could so that her head wouldn't be cut off at the top of the frame. A bunch of takes didn't even work because either I missed my focus marks or there was a bump in the dolly, 
or Victoria just didn't bend down far enough. Meanwhile, our friend Wes was kneeling right beside me so that he could remove the necklace from the counter and then place it on the floor. In several takes, you can actually see his hand in the frame, so back to one. Even though the shot was a real pain in the ass to do, I think it was the best way to shoot this part of the story. I always like to figure out how to convey information in the fewest amount of shots possible. I could have started with a shot of the door, and then a cut to the kitchen counter, then back to the door, then close on Victoria's face as she picks up the necklace, but that would have just felt clunky and distracting. I knew it was just a matter of time before we'd get the shot, and so we went with the more time-consuming yet simpler way of shooting this particular sequence. For this shot, where Victoria's in bed with her eyes open, I just rested the camera on its side on top of a pillow, and that was it. Creating the demon took a lot longer than we anticipated. Victoria took a mold of Wes's nose, and then used that to make this scarred-looking demon nose. She made the horns out of tinfoil, which we just spray-painted black. And then she painted veins all over his face. The horns and the nose kept on falling off because we ran out of liquid latex, so we came up with the idea of using fishing line. We wrapped the fishing line around Wes's face until everything held. We also gave him these plastic monster teeth we bought on Amazon. Victoria was standing behind him holding a small LED light with a red gel over it, just to get that scary hellish atmosphere. We had Wes make a bunch of scary faces, and that was about it. I was able to enhance the practical effects we made in After Effects by motion tracking the whites of his eyes, and using the Liquify filter to stretch out his mouth and teeth. It didn't have to be perfect, since we only flash it for a few frames at a time. When we began filming, I wasn't exactly sure how we were going to have the growing veins effect, but I had a few ideas. Victoria actually painted some veins on her chest with special effects makeup. In After Effects, I motion tracked the movement of the necklace and of her mole right here since they move in tandem with the rest of her chest. Then I masked out a piece of clear skin without any makeup and put that on top of the area with the veins. I feathered the edges so that it blended in naturally. Then I adjusted the mask path using keyframes and slowly, over the course of the entire shot, revealed the makeup underneath. It actually worked out even better than I expected. This was my first foray into creating special effects prosthetics, and it nearly drove me insane. I've dabbled a little in special effects work. I even crafted the monster in our short film Bedhead, but making these three fingers took me the entire afternoon leading up to filming. I used YouTube tutorials to learn how to make a latex cast of my fingers, then, after the latex dried, a liquid gelatin mixture is poured into the casts and chilled until solid. From there, you just peel the latex cast off and you should be left with perfect fake fingers. Sounds easy, right? It was a nightmare. In the first batch, I forgot to put finishing powder on the latex cast, so the latex kept sticking to itself and ultimately churned out some deformed, nubby stumps. The second batch was a great improvement, but it wasn't until the third batch of gelatin fingers where I finally got something usable. If you ever try this at home and feel like YouTube tutorials are just like, hey, try this super simple thing, and nothing is working for you, don't worry. I definitely know your pain. In the wide shot where Victoria walks into the darkness and gets devoured or possessed by the monster, I added a fog overlay in Premiere. It's a very subtle effect, but makes the whole sequence the tiniest bit more terrifying. The monster was pretty easy to make since we didn't really show all that much. The claws were bought on a website called Horror Dome, and to make those cracking sounds I just recycled an old sound effect I made for another short of me cracking celery in half. The roar was a combination of a bear growl and my voice slowed down 30%. I added a whole bunch of reverb so it sounds like it echoes in the canyon. One of my favorite parts of this film is the music. I think it was on the first day of shooting, I texted my friend Danny, aka Robot Disco Puma, these exact words. Want to put together some Stranger Things sounding synth drones and ambiance I can use for this next one? Victoria finds an ancient necklace in the woods which possesses her. We want this to have a scary Nightmare on Elm Street, Stranger Things, Friday the 13th feel. 80s and 90s influenced. Maybe even some Jumanji sounding tribal drums in some. He responded, okay, word, 80s scary? And that was about it. All the sounds were analog recordings, and he absolutely nailed it. You might even hear some of these sounds in some of our future short films. 
Lastly, we must take a moment and thank our amazing supportive patrons who love our shorts so much they're willing to invest one to five bucks a month so we can keep making more. Sophia L., Laura Cox, David Grossblatt, Buried Hatchet Productions, Sarah Dean, and Ole Petter Rotness. We really do love the support. This is just the beginning.